Thank you, Lord. Heaven come. Heaven come. If you guys will hover there just for a moment, I want to take care of a little business so that I've done that. Uh, I've got to wait till I have permission to use that. Are you ready, Teresa, to bring up the slide? I want to remind you that uh, this coming, when's the 23rd? What day of the week is it on? Would you say that one more time? One more time. It's good. Because I realized this morning I've been telling everybody Friday the 23rd. <laughs> That's bad shepherding right there. Now. <laughs> uh, so good. We're clear then. What day is it? Saturday the 23rd, we're going to gather at 5.30, eat together, fellowship together. Uh, we're going to celebrate the birth of our Savior together in fellowship. Amen? Amen. And uh, then uh, around 8 o'clock, we're going to have a service. It'll last probably about an hour. Uh, so what that means is we will not be here next Sunday. Look at your neighbor and say, we will not be here next Sunday. Okay, okay good. Now, the reason I wanted our team just to hover here just a moment, you, you can be seated. And I'm going to ask um, for a little bit of help. How many of you are kind of in a mood to help the pastor today? Is this help your pastor day? <laughs> Everybody good for that? Raise your hand if, you're, if this is help your pastor day. Now, what I'm finding interesting is all of the help your pastor people seem to be up front. Do I have anybody in the back area back there that's come to help the pastor today? Raise your hand if you're here for that. Good. Will you come up here and fill in these seats right here? How serious. I'm waiting. <laughs> Thank you. Now let me tell you why that's important for me. Have you ever noticed... I tend to wonder. Yes. Have you ever noticed that? Now, I'm going to tell you right now, thank you. I'm Seriously, thank you so much for doing that. Um, I don't think about doing that. That comes naturally. Or supernaturally, maybe on rare occasions, but it's primarily natural. Thank you. It's not so bad, is it? Um, but, you know, we've upgraded the camera system. And we have, you know, three or 400 people with us this morning online. And it just keeps growing every week. Go figure, right? Um, and if you notice where the lights hit up here, what they've told me is if I'll stay in those areas, they actually know somebody's preaching online. <laughs> if I step out of those areas, I'm on radio at that point, right? And if you're up here, I think it'll probably help keep me. We're going to find out. If the theory doesn't work, just sit where you want to next week. Amen? All right. Not next week. That's right. You, Dustin, you're on, you're on the spot. All right, so here we go. Worship team's kind of hanging in there with me for a moment. Not that we'll go back up or anything, but I want to I kind of keep that option open just for a moment. Uh, and remind you that we are in a, we're in this uh, very long and I hope helpful series called Finding the Kingdom Culture. And, um, and I've told you, and, and I'm being very, very sincere, I guarantee you I'm the one that has benefited most uh, from this. And, and I, and I want to give you just a, a moment if you ever, somebody turn, if you want to, turn in your Bible. Anybody, anybody own a Bible anymore? <laughs> or open your iPhone or... Android phone to Romans 12. <laughs> you know, we're singing about kingdom come, right? Yeah. I mean, that's our prayer. We're saying kingdom come. And, and uh, one, one of the things that... Now, we're, we're good card-carrying folks leaning to the spirit side of the equation in the body of Christ. So more than once, the kingdom has come like a wind and power... I remember once as a 25-year-old man, something like that, down at the beach, 
kingdom came to me for about two or three hours on a beach and it was like wind after wind that wave after wave of wind and it totally revolutionized my life I left that and it was never the same after that and, and you know and I know that that day I actually uh, that night I actually walked the aisle at Stony Point Baptist Church to surrender my life to the Lord the kingdom came into my life and uh, and the reason I know that was real is because honestly I've never been the same since then you, you understand uh, and and there have been times the kingdom has come and I have actually not as not as much as many of you in this room today but the kingdom has come and it has manifested in healing in this physical body and that's wonderful it's, it's better than penicillin I can tell you that it's wonderful amen but I, can I tell you something today the most consistent long-reaching and deep-reaching manifestation of kingdom come is the fact that time after time truth after truth should I say lie after lie the kingdom has come and manifested itself in my attitudes and the way I think because all of us were raised weren't we we were all raised um, in uh, perhaps good homes and perhaps very dysfunctional homes but but rarely a home in which the kingdom was really the manifest presence in that home uh, you know most of us were raised in a home and 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 maybe the best we got was a, a good cheerleading for the American dream right or or this or that right and so what I have found is the most wonderful thing the most wonderful manifestation of the kingdom is actually described in Romans 12, 1 and 2. And it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And here it is. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God. Look at your neighbor and say, that's the kingdom. What is good and acceptable and perfect. And so I want us to, um, I don't know, this may be incredibly awkward to find this spot. But the, I love the fact that when we sing together, we're praying. You know that, right? We're, we, when we sing together, we're declaring truth or we're declaring prophetically or we're praying. We're, we're interceding. We're asking God to do something. So I want to ask us and invite us to stand again just for a moment. We're not going to do this this long, but we are going to do it meaningfully. And let's, let's sing together. Let's sing in prayer together. Kingdom come. And cut me off so I can sing if, if you don't mind.
How can we say amen together? Amen. Say amen. Let it be, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can be seated. All righty. Are you comfortable? Good. Everybody good? Now, anybody back there really want to fill in these seats? You're free to come up now during the service. It's all good. It's all good. We're, we're uh, you know, we're like a, an airplane that takes off and you're free to move about the cabin kind of thing. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Uh, okay, if you're good and comfortable, I'll ask you to stand. Yeah, Dustin's a prophet. <laughs> discerning of pastor's intentions. <laughs> Father, we, uh, we invite you today yes. as you manifest your presence and as our precious Holy Spirit yes. to teach us the word. Yes. Lord, I'm asking that you would, um, you would press past weakness in my presentation and weakness in our own hearts and yes. defenses in our own hearts yes. and establish your kingdom yes. in a very important aspect of this human existence. Yes. So we invite you today, Spirit of Truth, yes. to lead us into truth, yes. life-changing, transforming. Jesus. And if you agree with that, just say amen. 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 All right. Good deal. Yeah, I, I, you know... Um, I have grown to believe over the years that um, you use your weaknesses to your advantage in the kingdom, right? right. Is that good? And uh, because the Lord's, yeah, I've, you know, I've figured it out. He tends to like weakness. I'm not sure what that's about, but he tends to kind of favor weakness. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to begin this morning a little self-disclosing in the week. Is that all right? Is that good? You guys good with that? That freak you out a little bit? Okay, you're good. You're you're here. You're gonna stick it, because um, it's really odd. You know, the the truth that we're gonna look at today is probably one of the two two truths that have most radically transformed my life. Not that I've arrived, and I can promise you I haven't arrived. But if you only knew where I began, you'd be pretty impressed with the Lord. Amen? <laughs> Sometimes it's not where you are. It's how far you've come from that's impressive. And, um, and, and so the real odd thing is um, that I don't know, I don't remember when I felt weaker bringing a word than I have. So I'm going to count on this being the Lord kind of making me lean in heavily to him. Uh, but let, let me say it, say it this way. I've... Since I've walked with the Lord for, what, 38 years now, I had two. I, 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 listen, there's been a bunch of stuff. Listen, if you only knew the junk that I've walked out of, uh, yeah. Now, if you knew the junk I've yet to walk out of, you probably wouldn't come next week to hear me preach. No, access, when it, right? You know what I'm saying? Uh, but there are two things that I'm still really incredibly amazed at. One, uh, I'll not go into, but I'll just to mention it to set up the second. The, the first was, I had some serious identity issues that I don't even know how to begin to explain. That it literally took the Lord years to unravel until I could actually begin to identify myself, not, as what, not according to what I did or proved but just simply, I was loved by the Lord. I don't know how all of that got rooted in there. Who knows? But it was, but it was real, and um, it was deep, and it was an intricate surgery that took a long, long time. And uh, that one, I think the Lord's pretty much, um, I'm, hoping, I, I'm hoping that one's over, and he's pronounced me clear of cancer, and I'm moved on, right? right. But the second one, I'm going to try to describe to you, and some of you will understand it, and the reason I'm setting this up for you is I want us to relax today and be together talking about something that may be uncomfortable in some ways for us, but it's kingdom. The, the second was, can you imagine living from the time you're aware, um, and what I mean is you become a young man, you get married, and now you're responsible for family, uh, which for me happened when I was like yet a baby. Kelly snatched me out of the crib when I was yet but 21. <laughs> 21 years old and uh, something like that, I think. 
Well, she was almost 18, so if that tells you anything, uh, she was in a real hurry. She, she got a good catch, and she wasn't letting me go is the way I figured. <laughs> and no, she wasn't pregnant, so let's, let's just settle that right now, um, just to make sure you understand that. Um, but, you know, the, the clock starts ticking in a whole different way when you get married. Anybody know that? It's like one day you are like Mr. Free and Easy, and the next day you're like, oh, God, what have I done? <laughs> Not because of her, but because of the weight of responsibility you suddenly start feeling. Yeah. And then suddenly, two or three years later, you got a baby. And mine's now, that baby is now 38, 39 years old. Can you believe that? Wow. Oh, wow. And so can you imagine, so... Up until probably in my early 50s, I lived under, I mean, I don't know how to describe this, so I'm going to try to describe it, okay? Have you, some of you will relate to this. I lived under this awful cloud that no matter how much money there was, it wasn't going to be enough. When things were good, the cloud was there. When things were tight, the only way I can describe that is wholesale panic. Anybody in the room relate to me? Am I the only one that's ever been there? Now, I'm going to tell you, from 22 to, let's call it 52, to do round numbers, 30 years is a long time to live under that thing. So forgive me if I feel very grateful for the Lord for having set me free. Amen. And uh, now I, I I probably still walk with a limp. Um, I remember when I remember the time. I remember, I remember. It's funny the things you remember when the Lord's taking you through stuff. I remember the moment when I realized I was free. And the next thought I was, I know there's a test coming. Anybody ever been there? That's the way it happens. You just read the parable of the sower. King, the word comes brings freedom, the test's going to come. It's only a matter of when and what will it look like. And I remember thinking, wondering, will I pass the test? And I remember, uh, I've got a good friend, Robert, Robert Mearns, you know, and he is just so for me and has been for so many years. And I remember him, and the test did come. It came within weeks, if not a couple of months, uh, after that moment of just absolutely knowing God's, uh, it's done, it's, I'm free. You know, I'm limping, I'm limping, but I'm free. And uh, I remember coming into this, this thing that uh, I believe the Lord set up. Um, and I remember Robert looking at me like he wanted to rescue me out of it. And I remember looking at him and saying, you cannot do that. I have got to walk through this. Because this will settle once and for all whether I have been healed of that thing in me. And so here yeah, I'm an old guy now. You know, I'm nearly 60 years old. Better late than never. Tell you now, neighbor, better, better late than never. <laughs> better late than never. So now I'm telling you, it's, 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 I mean, freedom is good. Look at your neighbor and say, freedom's good. Now, what I just described to you is actually a form of what the Bible calls, in certain translations, covetousness. Which is what we're going to look at today. And the reason I wanted to begin by disclosing is, number one, I figured it would help me kind of gain confidence to preach. Number two, it'll bring you with me so that you know I'm not talking at you. I'm a limper saying, will you go with me as, as I share with you how I got to victory in this area. Is that Okay. And uh, now, on a lighter note, look at your neighbor and say, on a lighter note, there's more than one, there's more than one time a kind of covetousness, and that's going to be an important part of what we study today. Uh, here's another one. I, I taught on this a couple of years ago, 2015. So now this is a test for some of you. Who is this lady? Imelda Marcos. Marcos. What is she known for? <laughs> Isn't that funny? If you ask anybody over a certain age, do you know her, they'll say yes, and you'll say, what is she known for? They'll always say shoes. Right, Pacey? From the Philippines. 
Well, for 20 years, her husband was the, I guess, dictator, I guess you would say, of the Philippines, and she was first lady. And uh, there was a whole lot happened in 20 years besides shoe buying, <laughs> right? Uh, and not only that, they were actually run out of the country in, in 86. She came back in 89 and served four terms in the Congress. I didn't even know that until this time I was doing a little deeper research. And that's interesting. But yet, what's she known for? Shoes. <laughs> huh? It was a lot of shoes. And it, it, yeah, the reason she's known for a lot of shoes is when they got, in 86, when they got run out of the palace, they went into her closet and found uh, various reports, but the most reliable, 2,700 pairs of shoes. Pairs. You'd have to have three assistants to help you organize when to wear them all, right? That's a lot of shoes. That's a lot of shoes. Now, I say that to say that's another kind of covetousness. <laughs> you understand? Uh, so, and there's more than two kinds, and we're going to talk about that today. But that's what Jesus is addressing in the parable we're going to look at today. He's addressing this human tendency to either hoard grab hold of, or even if you're not physically doing it, feel this panic on the inside to be doing it. You understand? The feeling of it on the inside is just as bad as having to happen on the outside, right? In fact, it might be better to own 2,700 pair of shoes than to hide it on the inside. I'm not sure. Uh, anyway, um, so let's look at this together. So um, someone in the crowd, I'm going to set up the parable. Someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now, the truth is this would not have been all that uh, uncommon, by the way. Um, actually, it was rabbis who would help people sort through uh, um, inheritance issues by helping them understand what does the law say about this. So it's not like the guy was like completely off base. Although if you read what he actually says, teacher, tell my brother to do, he wasn't asked, teacher, would you help my brother and I come to a conclusion? What's he saying? I know what's right. I know what's mine. Tell my brother to give it to me. Wow, come on, pastor. Right? All right. But, but he said, Jesus said, and by the way, if you, if you read it in the Greek, and it's not that I can read Greek, but I have books, right? When Jesus says, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? That's a slam down. That, what do you call it? A slap? What do you call it in wrestling? Smackdown. Smack down. <laughs> That's pure smack. Yes, yeah, smack down, slam down. <laughs> yeah, we're going to start keeping a, uh, we're going to start doing a new uh, um, Seth, can you keep up with the words and phrases I, I, I make up? <laughs> we'll split the royalties of the book someday. Right? So th this is a what? Smackdown. Smackdown. I'm telling you, this guy probably just wilted away. Whether he wilted away or not, <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, let's go back up here. All right. But he, and Jesus said to them, we're going to look at that in just a minute, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. We're going to look into that just a wee bit. Uh, so covetousness literally in the Greek is this, to have more, and it became this primarily, a selfish desire to acquire more and more money or material possessions. You get it? Yeah. Kind of simple, isn't it? Uh, we might use the word greed. We might use the word covetousness. Uh, but there you go. That's what Jesus is speaking to. Now, notice that it changes from this two-way conversation between this guy who knew what needed to happen. He, he knew he was getting cheated, so he's coming to Jesus to say, straighten this matter out in my behalf. And Jesus says to him, does a slant. Smackdown. Jesus does a smackdown and then ignores him and looks back at the crowd, which at this point was thousands. And he said to them, take care, be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. I'm going to tell you, if, 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 if the American church needs to hear anything, it's this truth. 
because a lie has gone out that has twisted and turned the founders of this country's desire that we would be free to become all that God created us to be into some form of we've been given freedom so that we can acquire all that we can acquire. But a kingdom principle is, we're going to look at it a little bit more, is your life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Now, notice that he says guard against. And this is important. And I was trying to think, you know, how do you do that? I wrote, I wrote this down. I, I'm impressed with facts and figures. Do you know, how many, how many know what that is? You read, anybody, can you read? Sunscreen, sunblock. 30, number 30. In 2006, the market for that in America, that kind of product, was $94 million. In 2016, it's one, it was $1.6 billion. What happened in those 10 years? Huh? Yes, exactly. More skin cancer, more studies, more awareness. And more and more people begin to discover, I am potentially susceptible to this. Now, I removed a, a, a slide at this point of two guys burned feet. Anybody ever had the tops of your feet burned? Yeah, we don't go to the beach much anymore. I'm not really kind of a beach person except in the fall when you can wear all of your clothes and not look odd. You understand? <laughs> But then those early days when you were obligated to take young boys to the beach and actually sit up there, and Kelly wouldn't allow me to wear my socks. And I'm not, still not sure about what, what that was about. For, for a few years, I didn't know about sunblock, and the tops of my feet just got red raw. Anybody else been there? Well, and she was at, insistent on this thing I couldn't wear. I can't, she don't let me wear socks on the beach. And she doesn't let me wear them with sandals either, and I don't think that's right. So, Mary, okay, all right. So that's fine. I've rebelled, but I wear them 24 hours a day, night and day, and she has to wash tons of socks, right? Um, but I discovered how wonderful that is before 2006. But everybody else came along and began to realize, gosh, Steve's not the only one who needs to be on guard. Now, the reason this is important is Jesus is talking to them, not to the guy. He didn't say, be on your guard, dude. Do you not realize you are in danger of covetousness? No, 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 no. He looked at the thousands of people that were now gathered around him, and he said to them, hey, folks, you better be on guard because you, you think I just did a smackdown? You think I just did a smackdown on this guy because covetousness just, just showed itself in public? You too are very susceptible to the same thing. Don't judge this guy. You see that. Very important. And, and, and now this is where I want to spend just a few minutes kind of in a teaching mode because I think this will be helpful. Um, the, the little things are important when you study Scripture, right? N notice that, um, that, that it says all covetousness. Now, go, if you look at your various translations of the Bible, uh, some of them say all kinds of covetousness. Some says all types of covetousness. Uh, some say every form of covetousness. Up, oh, is it? All right, that's it. Look at your neighbor and say, I think he means there's more than one. And I've already told you about two, so that means there's more than two. All right, now, ladies. Most, well, listen. Ladies, if you struggle with what this shoe that I've already put up, we'll pray for you <laughs> afterwards. Men, if you struggle with this pair of shoes, we'll fast and pray for you. <laughs> Amen? Amen. <laughs> now, I thought this, this is interesting because out of 2,700 pairs of shoes, is it even possible to have a favorite? Oh, well, as a matter of fact, there is. And this, is, this was Imelda Marx's favorite pair of shoes. Uh, I can't read the, the brand name, but they've got stones and gold and all of that. Uh, my guess is they're expensive. 
But evidently, she liked the way they fit because she ordered a bunch, a bunch of them. So, all right, so you, you with me? You, you like those? Are, are those called pumps? Huh? What? High heels, okay. Just checking, just checking. See, some things weren't, weren't worth the exploring Google to find out <laughs> to, be, <laughs> to be authentically entering your world, if you know what I'm saying. But, but now let's look at this just for a minute. So Amel DeMarcus, there's an interesting thing she said sometime later. You see, the most important time of my life, there was no shoes. Oh. What in the world would get into somebody's heart to make them have to buy a pair and pair of shoes. Well, this is not an excuse, but maybe, maybe it at least gives us some clue of an entry point, doesn't it? Isn't it funny how those things in our youth, and our, especially when we're really little, see a lot of people, this thing of covetousness, the vast majority of all six things we're going to briefly look at today were established when people are very, very young in their family of origin, usually, right? So check this out. Number one, there is covetousness driven by self-image issues. Some people are after what they can accumulate. Uh, they're after what they can uh, possess uh, and build because on the inside, they don't like who they are. And so the way to fix that is to accumulate more. Now, how many of you know you can never accumulate enough to fix that? Right? Number two, there's a covetousness driven by a need to win. Alan's taught us about um, uh, competitiveness, you know, how, how devastating that spirit is. And, but the truth is, one of the things that is driving um, some people's covetousness is th th there's, there's this need to win. So it's not even about what they're gaining, but it's about gaining something in comparison to somebody else, right? A third area, covetous driven by a need for the next fix. How many of you have ever bought something, enjoyed the thrill, and then a week later or a month later, It's going in your next yard sale. But boy, the moment you push the button, Amazon, see, Amazon's really smart when they develop that one-click thing. Oh, yeah. That was brilliant. You talk about tapping into the impulse to get a fix. See, one of the things, and we'll, we'll look at this briefly as we move on, but one of the things you got to understand is there's a kind of covetousness, and it's simply another addiction. This person's addiction is heroin. This person's is alcohol. This person's is accumulating, buying, getting the next fix. Do you see that? Now, there's another kind, a fourth kind, a covetous driven by desire to find comfort in things. So the more I can surround myself, the more rested and comfortable I can feel. And then a, a, a fifth would be covetous, driven by a quest for the good life. And this one, by the way, is the one that's most tapped into by advertisers in America, isn't it? And this is actually the one that probably lies at the root of what I would call um, post-childhood. This is the one that probably happens after childhood when you begin to be aware of what other people have and maybe about middle school and, and then the, the, the advertisers begin to show you things that um, convince you you can't live without or you're being cheated because you don't have that. Uh, whatever image you, you can get into your life, this is what the good life looks like. Uh, covetousness will latch on to that thing. And then once it latches on, it's like a leech and it just begins to drive your life. 
Okay, And then the last one we'll look at, and there's more than these, but these are the big six, is covetous driven by fear and or a quest for security. And I'm exhibit A for that, right? Say, look at, point at me and say, exhibit A. Exhibit A, okay. Now, I wish I would have put this slide a little bit later, but it was a little awkward, but I didn't want to leave the concept out. So, so we're going to hit it, and then I'm going to move on. Jesus said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness for one's life. Look at your neighbor and say, life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Now, the challenge with this is life, zoe, is physical life. It means life as God has it. But in this case, it means life real and genuine. Now, the problem with that is this. What your life real and genuine genuine feels like and what my life real and genuine feels like can be completely different. So about the only way to make this verse applicable to your individual life or to my individual life is to actually uh, say something like this. Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness for one's self-image does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Or take care and be on your guard against all covetousness for one's self of importance does not consist in the abundance of of his possessions. Or we could say, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness for one's deepest satisfaction does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Or I think one more, maybe two, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness for one's deepest sense of comfort does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Don't you love the fact that the Holy Spirit named himself Comforter? One called alongside to bring comfort. We're going to see in a minute when this is manifesting, it's tapping into that need that God has provided himself for. Amen? And then finally, we could say it this way. Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness for one's sense of material Security does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. See, that's the truth that revolutionized everything for me. When I realized that I'm never going to feel safe until I feel safe in God. And when I feel safe in him, it's really not going to matter whether I've got a little or a lot. See, that's what Paul tapped into and wrote to the church in Philippi about um, when he he says, I've discovered the secret of contentment. I've learned how to live when there's a lot, and I've learned how to live when there's a little, and my needle doesn't move. What's he saying? I've learned that my sense of security is never found in material things. It's only found with the one who's walking with me day by day, moment by moment. Yeah. Now, here's something that we're going to transition. I told you it's going to be a little bumpy, but I think it's, it's going to be powerfully good. Colossians 3 gives us insight into covetousness that is so critical to get. If you really want to understand it from a biblical perspective, from a big biblical perspective. Paul writes this, Put to death, therefore, whatever is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and check out that last one. And what? And covetousness which, by the way, I've studied it right and left, it's attached only to that one. He says, covetousness, which is idolatry. Look at your neighbor and say, covetousness is different than other earthly passions. Boy, that was weak, but I'm moving on because I'm running short of time. Just repent and do better next time. But let's make sure we understand what idolatry is, right? Idolatry is the rendering of worship or service to a false god. Ah, now now we understand why Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters for for a slave will uh, either hate the one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve or you cannot worship God and wealth or mammon. I think um, um, that word means riches, wealth, money, and or possessions. 
You see that? Why does he say that? Why does he single that one out? Because covetousness is the one thing that Scripture nails specifically as a competitor with God for your worship. Uh Uh-oh. Now, that should make some things start come together for why the enemy has put so much of his resource and time and energy into deceiving the church. That's it. And it's not true. He who dies with the most Jesus is going to be happiest as he steps into the other room. Come on. Check it out. And also, uh, that's why he said in Matthew 6, uh, 19 through 21, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust uh, destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. Because what? For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Sounds a whole lot like worship to me. You see that? Now, um, here's the pivot I want us to make so that we understand this in a really right way, okay? You ready? Look at me. We're going to hang in here, right? You're going to, because this is real, you, this little nuance uh, can change the game for somebody in the room today. Notice what he says here. Do not lay up for what? For who? Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Now, this is important because covetousness is actually service or worship given to a false god within ourselves. I want to pause here and and repeat it so that we get it. it. It's not the worship of material things. Nobody is out there worshiping material things. Nobody's out there worshiping money. Nobody's out there worshiping that stuff. The worship, what's happening is using that stuff to sacrifice at the altar in their heart. The God isn't the stuff. The God is that need in your heart. Do you see that? Check it out. So covetousness is actually service or worship given to self-image issues. Covetous is actually service or worship given to an unhealthy need to win. The God of. Say to your neighbor, the God of an unhealthy need to win. So you got to understand, this, this is demonic stuff. This, this is not some, uh, oh, let's do a quick prayer and get over it. This stuff is deeply rooted competition for God in the people of God's heart. These things are idols. And not only are we largely sacrificing ourselves, we're training our children to sacrifice at the same altars in America. Covetousness is actually service or worship given to an addiction to the thrill of acquiring money. Or things. Covetousness is actually service or worship of a need to find comfort in things, a desire for the good life, fear that we won't have enough. See, what what you got to understand is there was a moment, and it was by God's grace and His revelation, that I realized that this fear within me that drove me, and, and I finally came to realize, if I ended up with $50 million in the bank, that thing would still be driving me to get 51. There come a moment when I realized that that's a God trying to rule your life, Steve. It's time to stop worshiping. And turn your faith and attention to the one and only God. That's what Jesus is talking to in this when he says, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And then he told a parable, a saying. And you know, this is one of the most interesting parables because 
uh, I realized after preparing to study, we're not going to spend any time except on one word in the parable. You know why? There's not a culture on the face of the earth that couldn't read this parable without having a theolo- and not have a theologian explain it to them. It's, a, it's self-explanatory. Uh, the land of a rich man produced plentifully, and he thought to himself, What shall I do, for I have nowhere to store whose crops? My crops. Uh, uh, and he said, I will do this. I will say I. I. Say I. I. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, so you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. Because I have surely sacrificed greatly on your behalf. A great offering of worship has been given to you. And I'm going to tear down my barns and build new ones so that it can hold my worship to you. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? Now, just a reminder. Covetousness is service or worship given to a false god within ourselves. Can I tell you, this parable very simply describes worship. But the one word, of course, we do need to make sure we understand is this fool. I didn't practice saying that for effect. Say it with me. Fool. I mean, you know, anybody got a better way of saying fool? Is that, the truth is, is actually an adjective, and it, it's foolish, and they've made it a noun here. Um, it means pertaining to not employing one's understanding. That's a little awkward, but I liked it, so since I'm preaching, I put it in there. Uh, pertaining to not employing one's understanding. <laughs> have you ever looked at somebody and said, you haven't thought this through, have you? <laughs> That's what this word means. It's like, it's, like, it's like looking at this guy. God's looking at this guy and saying, you really haven't thought this through very well, have you? Now, Lori, th- I, I want to tell you something. This is not me. This is a quote. I'm going to put it in quotes. She's, she's my, I love her because she keeps me on the straight and narrow. Oh, I stepped out of the light. Sorry. <laughs> See that? I repent. I'm back. Radio show's over. Check this out. It, uh, one, one scholar said it simply means mindless or stupid. Wow. Now, <laughs> I thought some of you might struggle with the concept of mindless or stupid. <laughs> and if you did this with your drone, you clearly understand what the rest of us know about you. <laughs> or if you did this with your cat, Right? Now listen, what were they thinking? Well, all I know is this guy, I can't remember his name, but I couldn't resist. This has nothing to do with the sermon. (laughs) This is for me. (laughs) I couldn't resist. This is too good. That cat's dead. It is, I swear to you. Go Google it. Google dead cat drone. And you got to wonder, how does Steve find this stuff? It's a gift from heaven. It's a, it's a spiritual gift I walk in. Ch- check it out. So this guy's from the Netherlands, right? He's 37 years old a few years ago. His cat, the cat's name's Orville. Make the, make the connection. Orville, Orville Wright. Wright Brothers. Flight. That's the way they think in the Netherlands, I reckon. Well, so Orville gets hit by a car, seriously, and the guy decides it would be an incredible waste to bury Orville. Well, take him to a taxidermist, get him filleted, fixed up. You understand what this means, Terry. And then I'm going to make a drone, and seriously, he made a drone of him. This is actually Orville flying. (laughs) That is, now listen. I'm trying to teach you the concept of stupid. This is not stupid. This is creepy. (laughs) Look at your neighbor and say, that's creepy. 
But you, but you know what's really scary is the fact there are some young guys in this room right now who think this is the best thing you've heard in this whole sermon. And we're going to be seeing you on YouTube real soon. Well, Terry is a retired taxidermist for $2,000 per cat or dog or wild animal. As long as it's not above 20 pounds, he will partner with you in that. All right, check it out. All right, now let's move on. Say, say, get back to stupid. Get back to stupid. So in 2015, anybody remember this event? Some guys, in, you, were you up there, Dustin, in Lafayette Park, some guy. What were you thinking? To fly a drone heading toward the White House. Post 9-11. Well, I don't know what he was thinking there. What I really want to know is what was he thinking then. You understand? Now, here, here I, want, I want you to say something. I want to say something. I'll bet you that guy will never do that again. How many? Raise, raise your hand if you agree. I don't think, huh? He does. Oh, Nicole, you are a fashionista. He does, and that looks good. Socks on with the sandals. Yeah. Ke Kelly? Oh. Oh, that hurts my feelings. <laughs> Well, point taken, Nicole. You're right, Kelly. It's a stupid idea. <laughs> I've repented. But listen, think about this for a minute. Don't you think if the guy would have thought this through from a different perspective, he would have flown his drone somewhere like 20 miles away? <laughs> Right, And so I, the, just to save time, David Garland, a guy that I love to read, wrote this. From the vantage point of eternity, covetousness looks foolish. The dilemma is that's a real challenge for us. That vantage point is a real challenge to get from where we live today, isn't it? That's why we need the Lord to help us. Amen. But that's the point. And then Jesus goes on to make application. So that's the parable. And then he makes boom, Dustin, boom, application. So it is with the one who lays up treasure for himself. By the way, that is synonymous for what? Covetousness. So is the one who is covetous for any and every reason and is not rich toward God. Now I'm going to run through this quickly because we've already hit the, the, the main point. So you ready? Ready to run through it quickly? Yeah. We're going to get the application. This is, this is kind of what God walked me through. Now, notice what he follows up directly with this. I want you to see this. So he's taught this parable. He went kaboom. And then he immediately says to his disciples, therefore, what does that tell you? He's making application to them right now. And he says, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you eat, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh-uh. What's he doing? He's bringing out. This had to be. See, they didn't have the advertisements. They didn't have a lot of the other stuff. But I tell you, 99% of the people Jesus spoke to, they wondered where their next meal was going to come from. So they knew what this covetousness driven by fear and or a quest for security was, right? So Jesus immediately pivots from this selfish guy and turns to this very real type of covetousness right there within the hearts of his own disciples, right? And notice, though, what he, how he leads them, what he tells them to do. As you read through that, he gives this wonderful little uh, uh, um, talk about anxiety. And then he says, fear not, little flock, for it is your good Father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. So sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in heavens that don't, fail, don't, that, that, that don't fail and where no thief approaches and moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. i got to tell you something. This is critically important. So the real question is not, can I identify that I have an idol set up to some type of covetousness in my heart? 
The real question after that is, what in the world am I going to do about it? And Jesus' answer to that is simple. Sell the stuff that you've, that you've given in worship to your God and give the money away. Anybody want to say that's radical? Sometimes we need radical to be set free. Now, check it out. Proverbs 19, 17 says, Whoever is generous to the poor lends to who? And I will, he will repay for him for his deed. How many of you know, if you've ever read the scripture, if you've ever read the scripture and not left it realizing God has a tremendous heart for those who are struggling financially, you need to go back and read the Bible again. Uh, he has a tremendous heart. And one of the ways that we are rich toward him is to be rich toward or generous toward those who are struggling in our realm of influence. And we're aware of it. You, know, you gotta, you, Are you tracking with that? Yeah. Now, we're, I'm going to come back to something in just a minute. So, so just remember that. Now, also in Proverbs, there's the second. I call it the big twin. Where it says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Now, it would take a series to do a thorough teaching on tithing. Uh, and, um, and I'm not going to try to convince you of what I believe. But I want to show, show you something in Scripture. Um, that's what that's talking about. First fruits. First fruit. Ten apples. The first apple I pluck off the ten. What? Honor the Lord with that. That is how you worship God. It's a form of worship. Now, I'm, I'm going to hold that till I get to the end. because, Gosh, we have labored under this thing like it's some kind of legalistic, awful thing that we've just got to buck up and do. And when we get to the end, you're going to see that this is a gift from heaven. This is one of the kindest things God ever spoke into the earth right here. Now, I do want to say this, and I'm not going to read this scripture. I just want to point you to, to Genesis 14, 17 through 20. For those of you who want to get hung up on this whole thing of the tithe is under the law, no, the tithe's not under the law. The tithe began before the law with Abraham, our father of faith. Come on, and his son. Right? Who had that encounter with heaven and got up and said, God, from this day forward, if you'll walk with me and take care of me, I will give you a tenth of everything you bring into my life. Oh, I'm going to tell you something. If you, if you think that the tithe is, is an old covenant concept, you miss the, what the Bible's got to say about it. It's not an old covenant concept. It's an act of worship. And a wonderful one at that. Now, let's move on. Jesus, by the way, he had a chance in Matthew 23, 23 to nix it, and he didn't. I'm moving on. Now, here's, here's, here's the point. At its most basic level, generosity to God. And, and, and listen, I know generosity of God, to God is expressed with the time we spend with do, you know, I mean, there's many, many ways you can be generous and rich toward God other than financial, right? But I'm going to tell you something. This area, this, this financial thing, this covetousness, is um, it's running like 12 links down ahead of everything else. And so don't dilute this for one minute. Um, just don't dilute it. Because this stuff is, is for your freedom. Now check it out. By giving... Uh, back 10% of all that he entrusts into our hands. I mean, look at your neighbor and say, I think this is going to be too simple. <laughs> and by sharing with others in their time of need. <coughs> now, I want to show you something that could pivot this for you and change everything forever in the way you look at this. Because no matter how hard I've tried, some of, some of our hearts, when you, when you talk about this stuff, hear law. Here, obligation. Here, I ought to. I've got to. Now, I, I want to show you something. How many of you realize, um, I, was, I was talking with a couple of guys this week, and I began to realize that if I had been alive during Jesus' day, the way I love Scripture and anchor into Scripture, uh, I would have actually ended up 
in his crosshairs. Because I would have probably fallen on the side of those who were getting upset with him about the Sabbath. Because the Bible made a tremendous case about the Sabbath. I mean, if you ever read the Old Testament, I mean, it built a tremendous case for if you do anything, don't, don't violate the Sabbath. Right. And then in their perception here, Jesus is going around uh, violating the Sabbath, right? But at one point, he gives the clue that unlocks that, uh, but it also unlocks every other command that we would receive as an ought to. He, he said this, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. That unlocks everything. See, God did not give us these commands because he wants to see you uh, dot and tittle obey the Sabbath. He gave it because he knows humanity. And uh, some of us will, will never take a Sabbath and will never take rest. And not only that, it provided a wonderful opportunity for him to give a picture of salvation. What it means to come into the rest of God from your own labors, right? But that principle... It fits every other command that's been given in Scripture. There is not a command that's been given because God de delights in seeing people jump through hoops. How many of you know He doesn't need your money and He never has? And He never will. But He knows and He's given us a gift, a gift in the Scriptures to say, uh, listen, I'm going to give you some stuff that will help you deal with this idolatry of covetousness. If you will, from your heart, begin to learn to take 10%, one out of every 10 apples that I give to you, and if you will begin to bring that to me as an offering, and not just do it out of some obligation, but begin to actually think about it, engage with me in it, recognizing that as you do that, I'm going to be doing something too. Gosh, the tithes that I, the tithe checks I wrote without knowing this. I just hope God gives me maybe a hundred percent or one hundredth credit for those. Do you see this? The attitude. I mean, you can fill the coffers of heaven with your ten percent, but never worship with it. And not only that, not just not worship with it. But not realize that what he's given you that privilege for is because as you give, he's going to, he's promised to come into your heart and begin to dethrone covetousness. It's an active way, tithing is an active way of, of dealing with our enemy of covetousness in our heart. Remember, covetousness is actually service or worship given to a false god. I'm not going to go through all of those things again. Yeah, that's bad. I mean, even, even a guy that wanted to wear sandals with white socks recognizes that's bad. Listen. As citizens of the kingdom, we give first to become generous. Then we give because we are. I could have added and should have added maybe a, a fourth line. As citizens of the kingdom, we first give to defeat covetousness so that we might become generous. And then we freely give because we have now become generous by the grace of God. I wanted to close with one thing. This is probably a pastor thing. How many of you know what the most generous and celebrated act of giving in all of the New Testament was? Huh? Besides that, I'm talking financially. That was good. I should have told that. Huh? The widow's mind. See, the most generous act of giving recorded in the New Testament was a dollar and 81 cent. See, I know how the enemy works and I know how the, the, the soul works. And I want to tell you something. This is not about what you can do today. This is about deciding.
to begin to walk with God on a path of obedience, step by step. And if, if, if you need to start that with a dollar and 81 cent, that's all right. You've got a good precedent. But the key is the heavy digging, the heavy freeing begins as we week after week or month after month, ever how you do it, quarter after quarter, whatever it is, as an act of worship, realizing, okay, God, thank you for your provision into my life this week. Now, I'm, co I'm coming to your altar and giving you this. And now I throw myself open as you continue to tear down the altar in my own heart. As he looked up, Jesus saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor woman put in a dollar and 81 cent. I tell you the truth, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put in all she had to live on. Would you stand together? You know, I, I hope you get one thing out of today's message. I, I am not, nor have I ever been after your money. And if it will help you to begin to engage with God by giving your 10% somewhere else where it's God, please do that because what's most important is that you begin to engage with Him and the altars begin to be torn down in your heart. Amen. Jesus. Is that good? Yes. Amen. So you don't yes. take this as me trying to do something selfish. <laughs> Amen. I'm just going to pray. I'm not going to do an altar call today. and Because um, the Lord just has to sort through all of this in our hearts. And yes. remember, it took him several years to sort through stuff in my heart. But do you realize it began with one decision? That journey that ended in me being free began with a decision to say we're going to tear down that altar. And God, from now on, I'd been tithing for decades before, but from now on, my tithe will no longer be a check. It will be an act of worship with an expectation. So, Father, I'm asking today, Lord, this thing and all of its many variations and even more than, than the six that we've looked at today. This thing has so many tentacles, so many expressions. Uh, and, and it operates in our lives in so many different um, strengths. And, the, and, and Lord, the truth is we have no hope of winning this battle. Yes. So our only hope is to surrender completely to you. And we do that today. If you do that today, I'm not even going to ask you to raise your hand. This is you and the Lord in your own heart. Just, just say in your own heart, Lord, I surrender today. All of these areas that I'm driven in my life to covet, to hold on to, to go after, so that I am this or I feel this. And I ask, Lord, that you would begin to give me confidence and faith to interact with you with the means of grace that you've given. And we thank you for doing it. I thank you for doing it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you know, this does occur to me. This is an odd time for such a message, don't you think? But it does occur to me that we might just want to be more generous with those who are struggling here in these last week before Christmas as an act of worship, amen? So why don't we go out and do that, amen? amen? All right, well, I bless you today. You have endured a long and rambling serving, and for that, you deserve, you deserve a lot of grace poured out on you from heaven, amen? But I do bless you today to go out of here walking a free life, a, wife, a, a life that your neighbors can only look at and wonder. 
I bless you today. Amen. Let's sing together and then we'll go home. Amen. Bless you.